Welcome to the Student Pilot Podcast. My name is Simon Callis, a flight school owner. Each week, myself and my guests will be talking all things flight training and beyond to help inspire, motivate and support you on your journey to becoming a private or commercial pilot. Today we have our very own head of training on the show, Steve Mason. Welcome, Steve. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, no nice worries. To be here. So, Steve, I've known since around 2018, and he was indeed um, my last flight instructor before I passed. So, thank you for your help with that, Steve. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, now, since then, Steve's career has progressed uh, pretty quickly, actually. He became an aerobatic instructor, a head of training, a flight and ground examiner, and more recently, a flight instructor instructor. So, he teaches flight instructors how to be flight instructors. All of this in probably just under four years, I'd say three, four years. Yeah, it's about um, that, yeah. Now, that in itself would be uh, pretty impressive for most uh, people. Um, but Steve did this um, with a disability. Okay, Steve was told as a child that he would never walk as a result of being born with cerebral palsy. Um, Steve, can you tell us about your condition for people who don't understand it? and how that's impacted your life in, and you know, obviously good and bad ways. Yeah, so um, its full title is cerebral palsy spastic diaplegia. Um, spastic being a medical term, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, as well as a derogatory one. Um, so diaplegia means it affects both limbs, um, in my case being uh, the lower limbs. Yeah. So dia meaning two. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was caused by trauma at birth. Okay. Um, so I was deprived of oxygen um, and that developed uh, into cerebral palsy mm-hmm. and the way that's affected it so at school I used a wheelchair okay. um, I could walk learn to walk about um, I think it was about four I started walking so it's quite okay. late um, and then yeah I used a wheelchair at school um, could walk as well the reaction with someone just getting up out of a wheelchair is fantastic um, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely fantastic um and yeah I used that up until university at university and i remember the moment i just decided not to take it in okay uh the wheelchair it stayed in the car mm-hmm. um couldn't particularly tell you why um and yeah since then i've just um, not used it i still okay. have it but uh not used it um so as to how it affects me i mean it's you know i like to think i do everything everyone else does Mm -hmm. um there's the the thing like careers so certain careers aren't open to me so the military i'd like to think that that might have been an option yeah if things had been different um but in general terms which we'll probably talk about later nothing really you know if i want to do it I'll, i'll do it maybe differently yeah but i'll do it yeah so would you say that's impacted your life in a positive way as well? Because it might have given you um, more of an impetus to get things done because you've got, uh, you know, something to prove, if you like. Um, I don't know, really. It's a, that's a, an interesting question. Um, you know, it'd be easy for me to just turn around and say yes. But I, I don't, my, my day-to-day mindset, I don't think of myself as being disabled. You know, I just carry on as everyone else does. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I honestly don't really know. Um, yeah. Not because I'm avoiding the question. It's just, uh, yeah, it, it's it's difficult, yeah, yeah. To, to sort of, uh, yeah, it's a difficult question, that one. Yeah, okay. Um, so tell us what age you initially were interested in aviation and how that first manifested. So, a um, bit of a cliche for you, but one of my um, first memories was uh, actually being on a flight. Okay. Um, and I can tell you it was a British Midland flight. Okay. A DC-9, uh, which shows my age. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, I'd, excuse me. So, um, I'd have been about three or four, mm-hmm. um, and we're going to Turkey. And I just remember going in the flight deck, and um, I vividly remember all the switches and buttons. Yeah. And uh, we had a really good view of the Milky Way. So I remember the captain pointing out the Milky Way. Yeah. Um, you could see it really well that night, and, and that was it. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I was getting over a cold. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so since then, my parents obviously saw something in there. They used to take me to the airport to, uh, to feed the planes, as Dad. Feed the planes. Uh, feed the planes, as Dad terms it. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, um, so since then, uh, when I watched the aeroplanes and then later on, which we're going to ask me about in a minute, um, made the jump to learn to fly. 
Okay. And when you were younger, did you ever envisage that there would be a possibility that you could have a career in aviation? Um, yeah, absolutely. So as I say, uh, you know, it's something I always wanted to do, something I've been interested in as long as I can remember. And the whole disability thing was never sort of a factor in my mindset. So, you know, yeah. that's what I wanted to do. So that was what I was going to do sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what age did you first start flight training? Um, so it was 2002. Okay. Uh, that would have made me um, 13. Uh, and it was actually at Almat, so um, Almat Flying Club. Yeah. Um, so uh, used to do a lesson a month. So mm -hmm. my um, my mum used to drive me over, which was a big thing for her because she's uh, even now scared of the motorway. <laughs> <laughs> so she used to uh, bring me over. We used to have uh, 45 minutes a month. Yeah. Um, but yeah, parents paid for that, uh, which was really, really good of them. And that was my sort of first taste into aviation. Okay. Um, and back then as well, you were sort of expected to, to be there for the day and, you know, help get the aeroplanes out and uh, help clean them and, and things like that. So, you know, it was sort of that exposure, which was just as important as learning to fly. I think that's nice as well that you get involved on that level because you get to see more what happens other than just your lesson. Yeah. And it's a bit more inclusive, isn't it? Um, I think people who just kind of turn up for the lesson and shoot off afterwards are missing out a little bit. So in the first instance, when you started learning to fly, did you meet any level of, um, I want to say like resistance or, or um, doubt from the people who were teaching you in whether you could do it or not? Or So not civilian flying, so mm -hmm. um, which I'll come on to in a minute. So no, not that I recall. Mm -hmm. um, obviously the medical thing, that was a bit of a saga, which yeah. I'll come on to in a minute. But uh, I was also a member of Air Cadets. Yeah. And one of the first things, so my parents took me there, my mum took me there to um, go and uh, join the squadron. Yeah. And one of the first things he said to me was, hello. And then the second thing he said was, well, you know, he probably won't fly. Right. Yeah. Hadn't, hadn't asked me, you know, didn't know me. Um, so that yeah. was one of the, the first things he said to me. Um, so that, that wasn't great. Um, yeah. As it happened, I did fly with them, yeah. and I also went on to work at the uh, at the AEF where they take cadets flying. Yeah, nice. Um, but yeah, uh, but the medical saga. <laughs> but didn't sorry, there was a story you recounted to me about flying a microlight as well or something. Was that... Oh yeah, that was um, that was fairly early on. So um, yeah, that's uh, I'd forgotten about that. So. Um, uh, I want to say about 10 years ago, something like that. So, because um, I sort of started to learn to fly, had a break to go to university and yeah. then came back to it. So just when I was considering coming back to it, um, I brought myself, it was a voucher one, I remember, just to go and have a go at Michael Light, and it was a, what yeah. we'd term a trial. Yeah. Um, so when I had a go at that, it was a flex wing and I turned up and the guy just, I don't know, looked at me, he helped dress me. Right. One of the things oh, I didn't ask him the, to, yeah, they, they wear the, suits, the sort of suits. I didn't yeah. ask him to, so he helped dress me. So that was uh, that was not great. Yeah. Um, I asked him not to, but of course my opinion doesn't matter uh, in his mind. So he, he sort of carried on. Um, I was bundled into this thing without having a briefing. Right. Uh, he flew me about without um, letting me have a go, which oh, right. uh, was uh, part of it. So I thought, and then uh, yeah, sort of sent me on my way, and I didn't even get the uh, the chance to buy the video. That they'd so recorded, I which I uh, I would have done. So uh, I'd been labelled there. I think as soon as I, I walked in, um, and that's the only one time that that's happened. I think that that is just their attitude, though. It's not. Um, I, I, I'd imagine they don't give a particularly good service by the sound of it to anyone. No, I mean not... it, it's difficult to say, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's um, you've got to help people as much as they want to be helped and that's yeah, it yeah, yeah. You know, it's um okay so next question then um did you have any support back then was there any means of support in terms of funding or um any additional support people that were geared up to help people with disabilities fly at that stage um not that I am aware of. The Royal most certainly was. Um, Airability is a well-known charity that's been around a long time. Um, they do great stuff. I've never been involved with them. Mm -hmm. um, I've always done everything myself. 
Um, it's probably more to do with my mindset than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but no, not that I recall, not that I saw. There's certainly no funding available, okay. or there wasn't then. Okay. Um, now, one thing which I found really interesting about your particular circumstance um, is that you drive an adapted car, okay, which I find really amusing because you don't have an adapted aircraft. Um, and that has always amazed me that you fly an aeroplane like any able-bodied person, if not better, would do, but this car has to have hand controls. Um, now, I don't know the the ins and outs of flying adapted aircraft or when you would need to fly an adapted aircraft. Um, but can you elaborate on that a little bit for us? <laughs> yeah, so absolutely true. Um, all my cars since I've learned to drive, um, which was a very long time ago, um, have been adapted. Um, so I have push-pull hand controls, which is where um, you pull for the accelerator and push for the brake. Mm -hmm. And because you steer with one hand, you have what they call a steering ball. Yeah, like, um, which like is, a tractor. <laughs> yeah, well, my knob, as it often gets called, but yeah, a steering ball is its proper yeah. name. Um, so yeah, um, always done that, but uh, absolutely, I can fly a non-adapted aeroplane and do, and um, that has obviously been sanctioned by the CAA. Okay. Um, but yeah, and it's to do with the movement. So yeah. with the car, it's the ball of your foot. Right, okay. So um, the accelerator, so my particular problem is with the right leg, so it'd be the accelerator. Mm -hmm. um, so one option is to switch them around, switch right. the pedals around, which you can do. Mm -hmm. But that's how I learned to drive, so that's how I've always done it. With the aeroplane, it's your whole leg, um, right, which I've never never had an issue with. Does that not affect you with the tow brakes in the slightest? Or? No, I never had a no. problem with the tow brakes. Okay. Um, so in terms of um, checking your suitability to fly aircraft, Un assist, not unassisted, um, unadapted. Mm -hmm. What process did you have to go through to come to that conclusion and, and how did that work? So there's two parts of that. So there's class two and class one. Mm -hmm. um, so with class two, uh, when I started learning to fly, um, you know, I got, I'm getting towards solo standard mm -hmm. and the instructor had the, you know, the conversation with me as we do now, mm -hmm. saying that you need to think about getting a medical. Mm -hmm. So um, I uh, went along to a uh, doctor in Sutton Coalfield, which is where mm -hmm. I lived at the time, who by sheer coincidence, and I didn't know this until I turned up, was in a wheelchair. Oh, okay. Um, he had uh, motor neuron, but he had no idea, turned up and he was in a wheelchair. So mm -hmm. um, that was interesting. Um, so did the class two and issued it, and it came with the limitation that I could only fly with a safety pilot. Right, so okay. I couldn't fly on my own. Mm -hmm. um, so in order to get rid of that, I had to do a medical flight test yeah. uh, with an examiner, which I did. Um, he had no issues at all, so I got a uh, class two with no restrictions at all. Mm -hmm. um, roll on a few years to class one, uh, which was, was a bit of a saga. Um, so I went down to Gatwick for the initial uh, class one. Yeah. So did everything. Um, all fine to my knowledge and then got to the end of the doctor and he said, not completely unexpectedly, um, I'm really sorry, I, I can't issue it. I can't issue your, um, your medical. Um, you need to uh, go away and uh, get a MEP rating, multi-engine piston. Okay. Um, so, in fact, no, they didn't say that straight away, apologies. So mm -hmm. they, they basically said they need to look into it. Mm. Um, so this went backwards and forwards a bit and eventually they decided I needed to get an MEP um, went and got the well, sorry was that was that for the basis of proving you could handle asymmetric flight or? yeah so yeah. that was to do with asymmetric flight so um, I think a lot of the aeromedical branch at uh, the CAA at the time um, they're just not familiar with the disability which yeah. you know is, is fair enough um, so that was to do with asymmetric flight. They were worried about if one engine fails, would I have the strength and the control mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, counteract mm -hmm. the thrust on the good engine, mm -hmm. uh, which is essentially what you do. Mm -hmm. um, so I went and got an MEP rating um, at Coventry and uh, went back to them with the MEP rating and they said, oh, you know, we're, we're still not convinced. 
Um, they couldn't tell me why at this stage. Okay. Um, but uh, so very frustratingly, um, you know, I, I tried to find an AME who would uh, deal with this for me um, because at this time they were transitioning from not dealing with the pilots directly. You had to go okay. through an AME. Um, so first person on the list who happened to be nearby um, was, was really, really helpful and sort of fought my corner and uh, went backwards and forwards and eventually I, I got issued with a uh, class one. How long uh, did that, that process take? Um, that was about two, three years. Okay. So that, that's a long time to be yeah. battling. I mean, I, the longest, I had problems in my medicals, but I think it was seven months and that seemed like an eternity to me for mm -hmm. two or three years. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that must have been difficult. Can you tell us how you kind of prepared yourself for the obstacles and how you managed to remain committed to, to getting through it? Um, I mean, it, it was difficult. I had, um, I had a big period, you know, where I didn't fly at all. Mm -hmm. Um, so I mean, that was mainly to go to university, um, and, you know, do, do the education thing. Um, but it was, I mean, there's been times when it has been difficult and you just can't see an end to it, but you, mm. you've got to just keep going and, you know, look at the end goal. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm sitting here now with a class one, yeah. um, you know, doing what I do, you know, yeah. you've got to sort of try and, you know, envisage that. Yeah. Okay. So do you have any advice for anybody who um, perhaps is a sim in a similar situation, perhaps they've had a lengthy medical uh, process, how, what advice you give to them? Well, just keep going at it and, um, you know, and this doesn't go for the CA, this goes for anyone. They're not always right. Just because they're a big authority doesn't necessarily know, mean they've got all the answers. Yeah. Um, you know, just keep fighting your corner. Mm -hmm. um, there are people out there who can support. Um, I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. If anyone ever needs any help, um, you know, and, and just get advice um, and get help on, from people. Is there any specialist AMEs that have experience with this type of thing? Um, not to my knowledge, okay. um, but you know, with the nature of AMEs being obviously Medical. normal doctors yeah. as well, there, yeah. there will be some who've dealt with this a lot more than, than others. But I mean, that's an interesting point. That's what I'd say. Do your homework, get in touch with AMEs, ask them, Yeah. Um, you know, ask them what their, their specialism is because they'll all have a specialism. Mm. Um, and you know, you, you might be surprised uh, as to what that is. Mm -hmm. Might be something that will help you. So... You finished your PPL in, what year was that? It would have been 2014. 14, okay. Yeah, it was. So we spoke previously about where you're at now. Can you tell us your journey to getting where you are now? How long that took and what the process was? So from PPL? From PPL, yeah. Um, it just sort of happened. So um, I carried on my, as I said, I left my PPL alone um, probably around 2005-ish. Um, just to, you know, concentrate on education and things like that. Um, picked it back up when I had a decent job. So I was um, a supervisor on the railway for a large rail freight firm mm -hmm. and making reasonable money, uh, picked it back up because I just thought one day, I was in the office thinking, it's one of those, oh, one day I'm going to get my PPL, one day I'm going to get my PPL, one day I'm going to get my PPL. And I vividly remember thinking, so when is that? You know, yeah. we've got to do something about it. So I did, um, came uh, to Coventry mm -hmm. here and uh, got through it. It took me about, all told, about nine months from that. I got through it fairly quickly. I was quite lucky. Had one instructor. That's, that's pretty good, um, isn't and it? And just got, got yeah. through it. Um, the hours I'd done before counted as well. So yeah. it was a um, slightly skewed time frame there. Uh, got through that and then just... Um, I actually didn't fly for a bit after that. I actually was quite nervous of flying, believe it or not. That's quite common, isn't it? Yeah, it is yeah. quite common. I didn't really know what to do with it. I was quite nervous of flying. And, uh, yeah, um, I actually forced myself to get an aerobatic rating because of this. Okay. Uh, I, I, even now, I don't particularly like aerobatics. It's no secret. No. But, um, yeah, I forced myself to do that just to fly outside the envelope a little bit mm -hmm. and make myself a bit more comfortable. And then... Uh, that got me back into it and just started, uh, you know, doing a bit more flying. Um, I started going overseas with, with a few friends and um, that was really, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, doing a bit more, expanding my envelope a little bit. And I got made redundant at work. 
Okay. And I got a payout, and the payout was almost exactly the same amount as an FI course. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> um, so because of all this hour building I've been doing, I had the hours, so I um, went and did that. So what is the hour requirement? Because um, just for anybody who's listening who's interested in becoming a flight instructor. Oh, it's um, 200 hours for FI. Mm. It's 200 hours of which um, 100 hours of PIC. That's if you've got a PPL. So okay. don't forget, I was still a PPL holder at this point. Yeah. Um, which is quite important. So anyone listening, you absolutely can be an instructor with a PPL. Perfectly legal. But it does restrict you to what you can teach, I think, Steve. Yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it does. So if you're just a straight PPL holder, you can only teach towards the lapel, mm -hmm. if, which was my situation at the time. If you've got ATPL knowledge, um, you can teach towards the PPL. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, where I was. I got the FI rating, did the AOC, um, which is assessment of competence, which in mm -hmm. itself is a funny story. Um, so the uh, examiner turned up, mm. told me that he couldn't do the um, <laughs> couldn't do the AOC because he was double booked and went away. I was, well. shall we say, very very upset. Yeah. And an hour later, he uh, he turned up, said that he got on the motorway and thought, what was I doing? I booked first, and he no word of a lie came with a big bag of pies. <laughs> 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 with a big bag of pies and said oh I bought you some lunch uh, which was bizarre um, but anyway yeah we went and did the AOC and passed that um, that was surreal hmm. um, and yeah I could uh, only teach towards the lapel mm -hmm. uh, which I actually did for quite a long time this yeah. is quite a little known fact now but I could only teach towards lapel for quite a period and was sustained by sort of trial lessons um, yeah what we call class rating stuff so people have already got a license mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was fine for a bit but it, it wasn't enough for me I always wanted to teach PPL um, I had a few full starts that tried to do the ATPLs <laughs> um, Simon will know all about this yeah. because uh, yeah uh, <laughs> I didn't think I'd ever get that done um, but yeah so when I first started doing the ATPLs I wasn't particularly serious about it um, Long story short, ran out of sit-ins because mm -hmm. you get six sit-ins for um, ATPLs. Yeah. Um, and uh, when I was doing this job, I, you know, it became more and more critical that I got it because I just yeah. wanted to do more with instructing. It was sort of a bit of a, a barrier to me. Um, so just book and down and did it basically eventually and surprised myself. I actually, eventually did it quite quickly yeah. in about nine months. Um, with a really, really good school who unfortunately aren't about anymore, mm -hmm. um, so I can't plug them, but uh, they were really good. Um, and then uh, me being me, couldn't sit still and uh, went and got um, the examiner next, I think. And the most yeah. recent one is uh, FIC. Mm -hmm. So if anybody doesn't know, FIC is the Flight Instructor Instructor Qualification, isn't it? Yeah. A lot of people misinterpret that as the flight instructor course. So that all came about a sort of period of three to four years, something like three and a half years, wasn't it? It was after COVID. So um, I was doing my ATPLs, mm. the successful go at my ATPLs um, during the end of COVID mm -hmm. uh, because we had all the uh, all the measurements. We had to go in wearing masks and yeah. things like that, which is uh, doing a two hour exam wearing one of those so a F, if it's a FMPT free masks yeah. is not great. <laughs> no. um, did you face any additional requirements or challenges during the commercial flight training sections of the course other than the asymmetric flight we spoke about already? Um, no. So by this point, I'm all medicaled up. Um, just trying to think. So no, I, I don't think the actual CPL course, there was any additional, mm. other than the usual, you know, um, I had to do it in a PA-28, which I, I don't like PA-28s. <laughs> Getting in and out of PA-28s is, is not easy. No. Um, but no, I don't believe so. Okay. So um, what advice would you have for an aspiring pilot, you know, private um, pilot in this instance, that has a disability, where should they start? Um, so talk to people. Um, so talk to people, um, 
learn off other people's experiences. So concentrate on the end goal. Mm -hmm. So, but also appreciate that you, you've actually got to go out and do do it. Um, you know, other people can't do it for you. So yeah, okay, asking for advice is is one thing, but ultimately you've you've got to sort of go out, go somewhere, and go and do it. Mm. Um, there are charities out there who will assist. I've never used them. Um, I've always um, sort of done everything myself. Okay. Um, but there are charities out there who offer advice. Um, a simple Google search will bring those up. Um, but also, on the flip side of that, you know, then they're not the be-all, end-all. Um, yeah. You know, there are other ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I recently corrected um, a, a major blog um, because they had put that uh, these charities are the only way for disabled people to get into aviation. <laughs> and it's absolutely not the case. No. It's, it's not the case at all. Um, and I corrected them and they apologised. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, so just keep an eye on the end goal. Um, there's plenty of advice out there. And um, just appreciate as well that, you know, your story is your story. Yeah. Um, so we all do things slightly differently and that's absolutely fine. Just find what works mm -hmm. and, and do it. So obviously it depends on the extent of somebody's disability as to, um, you know, I saw something really interesting. I think it was in America. There was a girl who was flying just literally on hand controls and things. And she'd done a massive trip or something mm. um, just on on hand controls. And it was really, really um, inspiring. For career purposes, obviously, I, I guess the extent of the disability really does matter as to what you can do. Um, but generally, is it still possible for somebody to have an airline career, do you think? Um, so what I've been told, as long as you can get a class one, okay. there, there's not an awful lot the airlines can do. Yeah. Um, so for that, I would, I would say, you know, if you can get a class one, yeah. Potentially, yes. Um, I'm not a doctor, so. Mm -hmm. I'm t but um, but in terms of but commercial flying isn't the be all end all. That's the oh thing. no no I get yeah. it. It's just that a lot of people who are looking to learn to fly they kind of um, idolise jet pilots if yeah. you like, and it's not from what we've heard from various different people. So, you know, there's lots of different careers you can go into. It doesn't necessarily have to be airline, but it. But essentially, the point I was trying to get across is that it might not be a dead end. It might no. be that you have to do a, jump through a fair few more hoops, but it may still be possible. So don't don't give up on the dream necessarily. Yeah, you know, exactly. You... And there, there will be jumping through hoops, and to be honest, for good reason. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the most important thing in aviation is is safety, and that's got to be right. Um, yeah. So yes, I I had a bit of a a saga getting my class one I don't particularly resent it mm -hmm. it was all for good reason and you know because we've got to be absolutely safe but yeah it's um not the be all end, end or jump through the hoops and yeah so let's talk a little bit about mindset I imagine one of the toughest things to get through the problems you've faced is not just the physical challenge of flying with a disability but maintaining a positive outlook amongst some of the negativity and barriers you've faced on the way um, yeah, so you, you get the barriers, and obviously straight away, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to pretend not, you know, it, it's not good, it feels horrible, um, mm. but you've just got to get over that and say concentrate on the end goal. Um, it's frustrating more than anything. Um, so, for example, the a, a lot of things with disability is, is ignorance, so, you know, generally there's a lot more good people out there and people who want to help you than there is bad in my yeah. experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's just, it's just people don't know, especially the British, quite how to treat it yeah. or how to approach it. It's all taboo. Mm. So that can be frustrating. It can be very frustrating, but mm. that's where you've got to sort of educate people and sort of show them what they can do and, you know, sort of keep working with. But yeah, and just concentrate on the end goal. It's probably quite a controversial question, and I've not put it in the um, in the list of questions I sent you. So, <laughs> and this is definitely unprepared. But with that in mind, have you ever faced a situation as a professional pilot where somebody has made comments about your disability with a view to you flying with them? Yeah, I got told I was a bit of a mess once. <laughs> so yeah, 
Um, so I got into a, um, and I think this is the only time it's happened. I've been told a few times by the other instructors that people have discreetly asked. Right. I mean, that's okay. regularly common. Yeah. If I'm okay to fly with, to which hopefully they say yes. But yeah, the one time I um, got in with a guy and um, he literally said, he looks at me, he looks me up and down like that and he goes, oh, you're a bit of a mess, aren't you? <laughs> So we tried to sort of stared at him, and then he realised what he'd said, yeah. and sort of tried to backpedal, and um, it, it just made it worse, to be honest. And, uh, so how did that flight go? <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's just it was not his fault. It just uh, you know he was just curious and didn't know uh, how quite to. how to approach it. But mm. um, but in all seriousness, I mean that was a bit unfortunate, and I don't think for a minute he meant it. I think. Mm. Uh, he, he probably uh, thought, yeah, thought about that for yeah. quite a long time, I would have thought. But, yeah. you know, it, it generally people do ask, and that's good. And, you know, never ever be mm. afraid to ask someone about their disability because most people, if not everyone, won't mind. It's just yeah. a part of, you know, sort of a, a part of their makeup. Well, we had a, a positive instance, didn't we? We had one um, young lad with cerebral palsy who we took flying, um, yeah. which was Nathan's lad. And,. Sam, who recently passed with us, um, he said to you about, you know, do you have cerebral palsy? Because my brother has it. Yeah. And, you know, at some point we will be taking um, little Max flying as well. So yeah. I think there's a lot of positives to come out of it. Um, so one of the things we've discussed as, as friends and colleagues is what your career looks like later on because we're trying to sort of help you... Um, plan forward because at some point you've you've said that it might come to it that your health isn't as such that you will be able to do the flying as frequently as you would have done um so tell us what you know what some of your plans are what you what you'd like to do well i quite like to um you know give back and help other people you know i, I feel myself fairly fortunate mm -hmm. being able to do what i've always wanted to do um you know i mean like any job sometimes you come to work and it's like what work but at the yeah. end of the day, what we do is pretty, you know, dare I say it, uh, living the dream. It's, yeah. you know, it's pretty good. Um, so I'd quite like to play my part in, you know, giving back. So, um, you know, offering advice on my journey. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's been a fairly complex one. This podcast is just scraping the surface. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's things that's happened that I'll have to sit and think about to try yeah. and recall them all. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I'd like to do that, give back a little bit. Um, I am um, currently in the process of preparing a website just with my, um, mm -hmm. no URL yet to plug, but um, with my uh, experiences and advice. So I'd like to offer advice to people. Yeah. And it's not just disabled people, anyone who's got any sort of, you know, what they deem as being a barrier. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. it's, it's the same sort of thing. It, it um, you know, lends itself to, to anything that sort of advice I feel I mean one of the things we we started on as a school was obviously promoting our own scholarship after we'd worked with uh, the likes of fantasy wings um, and one thing you'd mentioned to me is that we'd try and bring some of your help within the school to try and promote flying for people of any background any any barrier that they have to flight we, we want to try as a collective of people to to address and I think you are fortunate in your experience that although it's been partly a negative experience for you but it could be a massive massive upside for other people to be able to talk to people like you and and get your wealth of knowledge and experience so where can the viewers find you on social media if they want to connect with you so on social media um, it's CP pilot um, so you can find me on there and that's on Instagram. On isn't Instagram, it? apologies, yeah. So yeah. only on Instagram at the minute. CP Pilot, um, and uh, as and when the uh, the website comes on, all that will be uh, will be plugged on there. Yeah, no problem. So we we will share your uh, website as well when that comes live. Um, but yeah, so check out Steve CP Pilot on Instagram. So Steve, thank you ever so much for sharing your story uh, with us. I'm sure it's been a huge inspiration for anybody who's struggling with learning to fly. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. No worries. <coughs> Um, last thing to say is if you haven't already please subscribe to the channel smash the like button follow us on all our uh, socials so we're on instagram at our Matt flying academy uh, facebook at our Matt flying academy and on youtube as well see you on the next episode
If you like this episode, please like, subscribe and ding the bell to receive notifications of the next episode.